I want to extend a very happy Mother's Day to each of the women in our congregation. We are so blessed by the gift of your lives and what you mean to us. And each year we have a tradition at Grafta where we give all the women a flower. And I'm sad that we won't be able to do that this year the same way. So I've been passing this flower here in Akron Park for the last number of weeks. And every time I pass it, I admire its beauty. And so I offer you this, this flower growing wild and free here in Akron Park as a symbol of our love and appreciation to each of you, the women of our congregation. Happy Mother's Day. May you be blessed. I greet each of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of us may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We are gathering this morning in ways that we are able, trusting in the Spirit of God to empower and enable us to encourage one another, to build each other up in our faith. And I want to express my appreciation and my thanks for the many ways you have encouraged me this week. And I, I know of all kinds of ways that is happening among our faith community where people are speaking life and encouragement and they're obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit to call one another, to encourage one another. And I pray that that continues to happen by the grace of God. We are recognizing that in the midst of this time, many of us are growing weary. I am so eager for that day that will come when we are all able to be back together face to face again. I don't know when that will be, but I'm looking forward to it. And I am, I am growing weary of the ways that we are restricted these days, as are many of you. And I'm recognizing that, that that's a very normal thing. And I believe that we need to extend a word of grace to one another. In the midst of however you're experiencing this, whether you're experiencing some level of depression, or sadness, or resentment, or some anger, frustration, all these things are very much to be expected. Some of you are, are wondering why you're so tired. I know different times I've wondered that. I did some reading this week that helped me understand that psychologically, that during a time like this, our brains know something's different, something's out of the ordinary, and, and there's a way in which our brains are in fight or flight kind of mode, a stress mode that, that has a way of wearing us down. It's a little bit like a computer that has multiple kinds of programs running at the same time. And you wonder why your computer's running so slow, but there's these programs running. That's our brains right now. And we are also being denied some of those things that we are designed for, the social interaction that's part of life. I know for me, one of the things I enjoy is, is going into the Subway restaurant in New Holland. And, and I like going in there and they know exactly how I like my salad, how I like my chicken, what I like, what I like on it. And uh, when I come in and they say, ah, do you want the salad like you usually do? That's a moment of human interaction. One of those little things that helps you feel like you're part of a, a social network. We are created for interaction. And when we are denied that, it can, it can help. It, we don't quite feel ourselves. And that's, and that's normal. And so I just want you to know this morning and proclaim to you, you are loved by God. You are precious of God's sight. Romans 8 tells us, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any other powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear those words? Do you believe them? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The scriptures give us many admonitions and encouragements to not be anxious and to not be weary. The first Peter tells us, cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. Matthew chapter 6 says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. In Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but all things by prayer and petition present your request to God. And yet we know that there are times where some of you would love to not be worried, would love to not be anxious, and you just can't stop. And I want to proclaim to you today that even if you can't stop worrying, God loves you. You are not beyond the love of God, even if you cannot snap out of whatever it is you're feeling right now. You are loved by God. It's, it's, love, it's God's love that moves us to make changes. You know, I remember when I was a boy, I got my first alarm clock. 
and it was it would light up so I could see it at night and I would lay there in bed and I would watch my clock and I knew what time my alarm was going to go off say six o'clock and when that clock turned to 1030 I would think about oh now I'm only gonna get seven and a half hours of sleep and I would keep watching the clock and the clock would go on and at 1130 I would I would panic and think oh no six and a half hours of sleep that's all I'm going to get I've got to get to sleep right now and the more I would try to get to sleep the more I couldn't sleep some of you feel that way with anxiety with worry with depression with being frustrated with feeling out of sorts and God says I love you where you are you are not out of the reach of, of God. That it's God's love that transforms us. There's a story about, an old legend about the sun and the wind. And the sun and the wind were having an argument about who was stronger. And they decided to have a contest. And they looked down and they saw this traveler that had a coat on. And they said, which of us do you think can get that traveler to take off his coat? And the wind went first and blew and blew and huffed and blew and, and the, the traveler hunkered down and, and wrapped that coat around him as even tighter and tighter and tighter and the wind blew and the, the, the guy wrapped his coat on tighter and the wind finally gave up. And then the sun said, let me try. And the sun began shining on that traveler and, and that traveler got warm. And the warmer he got, the, he was inclined to take off that coat. And the image of it, that that's the love of God. The love of God changes us. We respond to the love of God. We love, we obey because God first loved us. I love the story in John chapter 4 of the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And this woman was going to the well in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. There was a reason for that. It was because she was ostracized. She was rejected. She was known as an immoral woman who had had five different husbands. And the woman she was, the man she was living with currently was not her husband. And so she was rejected. She had to come to the well when all the other women were at home. All the other women would come in the morning. It was a social kind of time. It was when they would connect with each other and talk and share the news of the day. And, and it's where they laughed together as they gathered, as they, as they filled their water jugs and went back to their homes for their many responsibilities. But this woman was disconnected. You could say she was forcibly socially distanced. And she had to come to the well alone. Some of us these days, as we are cut off from so many of the different social kind of things we would like, maybe feel a little bit like that woman at the well. That we are cut off from the social interactions that give us life. But this woman was doing this because she was ashamed and because she was rejected. And Jesus was there in the middle of the day. And he engaged this Samaritan woman in conversation. And this woman was shocked by this because not only was she a woman, but she was a Samaritan. They were despised by Jews. And she was known to be a woman of bad reputation. And Jesus engaged her. And he spoke life to her. And he asked her for a drink of water. And then he proclaimed to her that if she knew who he was, she would have asked and he would have given her living water so that she would never thirst again. And he proclaimed to this woman... This immoral woman who was a Samaritan, rejected, he proclaimed to her, I am the Messiah. And he told her uh, various things about her life that she knew that only someone from God would know those things. And she went on her way rejoicing. And she went back to her town and said, come, let me tell you about a man who told me everything I'd ever done. That all the different people over the years who probably tried to shame her into changing her behavior, who probably tried to scold her, lecture her, who rejected her, none of that caused her to change her life but the love of Jesus when he looked at her spoke to her in a way that she had never been spoken to before changed her we are motivated and transformed and changed to at lives of obedience by the love of God I think about Matthew and we are encouraging our congregation to read the book of Matthew. And this past week, we, uh, we've encouraged you to read from chapter 5 to chapter 10. That if you read one chapter of the book of Matthew each day, you'll get through the book of Matthew in the month of May. So on the 10th of May, read chapter 10. On the 11th, read chapter 11. And you can catch up. There's 28 chapters. But Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew was a tax collector. He was Jewish. And he worked for the Roman Empire. And the, the series that's on YouTube that I've been encouraging you to watch is called The Chosen. And The Chosen has stirred my imagination to think about these disciples like Matthew as real people. Matthew 
was perhaps a very talented, gifted young man. He was good with numbers. And as he grew up as a Jewish boy, his talents were obvious to those around him. And they caught the attention, perhaps, of the Roman authorities. And they presented an opportunity to Matthew that he could be a tax collector, a publican, which is the person who would, take, who would collect the taxes from the, the Jewish people in that area. But tax collectors were hated and despised by the Jewish people because they were seen as traitors. Because the Jewish, the tax collectors was was given a job. They said, you have to collect a certain amount of money from this region and turn it over to us. And then they were allowed to charge as much as they wanted and they could enrich themselves. And so they were seen as people who were enriching themselves at the expense of their people. Can you understand why? The fellow Jewish people would have hated Matthew. The the series, The the Chosen, even shows this this episode with him talking to his parents, that even his parents probably despised him and were ashamed of him and felt like rejecting him. That was Matthew. And this, this job as a tax collector enabled him to live a very wealthy life. He likely had one of the bigger houses in town. He wore fine clothing. He had a secure financial future. Life was secure for him, even as he was despised. But one look from Jesus changed that. And the chosen, the series shows the way that Jesus would look at Matthew as he walked by his tax collector booth. And it was a look of of love, not of condemnation. And Matthew would, would perhaps see different miracles that Jesus would do. And he would be intrigued by this Jesus. And one day Jesus came by Matthew's tax collector booth as recorded in Matthew 9. And Jesus said to Matthew, Matthew, follow me. And the text very simply says that Matthew left his tax collector booth. He left his job. He left his secure position in the Roman Empire. He left his his lucrative position to follow Jesus, not knowing if that would necessarily mean his Jewish, his fellow Jews would come to accept him and love him. He followed Jesus and left everything. People probably lectured Matthew all along the way about how he shouldn't be a tax collector. And that wasn't enough to shame him into changing his behavior. But the love of Jesus, that look of Jesus, the way Jesus spoke to him, the way Jesus called his name, changed him. And that's true for each and every one of us. It's the love of God that motivates us to a changed life. Jesus, in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, there's a sermon recorded by him called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is, is the most significant teachings of Jesus summed up in several chapters. And a lot of people think that this wasn't just one particular sermon Jesus preached, but perhaps was, was the culmination, the, the distillation of, of lots of different teachings that Jesus would have done as he walked along the road with his disciples, as, as he sat around a campfire with his disciples, as they uh, perhaps fell asleep in the night. He was teaching them all along the way. And the disciples later on, wrote these down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a, these are very rigorous teachings. They, they, they often say things like, you have heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and do good to those who mistreat you. The, the, Jesus is raising the bar very high. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. These are difficult things. Jesus says, not only are you not to to commit adultery, but anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery already. Jesus says, I am raising the standard. I am raising the bar. And, you know, lots of rabbis and teachers came through in these days and had teachings of various kinds, and their teachings were long forgotten. But we today still have Jesus' teachings as the Sermon on the Mount. What was it that made Jesus' teachings so powerful? And I want to submit to you that it was the love that Jesus showed and displayed to his disciples that moved them to a place of following him. And after the resurrection, moved them to obey and live their lives for him. Love compels us. That, uh, that it's not just enough just to, if we own our own strength to say, well, I'm going to just try my hardest to follow this teaching. That won't get you through. But when you're moved by the love of God, you are changed. You're compelled to live a different kind of life. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about why we shouldn't worry. He says, do not worry. 
he says, the pagans worry because they don't believe in a God. And so they, they have to take care of themselves. And so they are consumed by anxiety. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be consumed by anxiety. And what's the key to that, Jesus says? He says, you need to know how precious and how valuable you are. He says, consider the flowers. Consider the flowers of the field. They are, they're so beautiful. And yet at the end of the day, these flowers are, are often thrown into the fire and burned. And there was a kind of flower that was known at this time that was, was absolutely beautiful, but it was a flower that only lasted one day. And at the end of the day, it was used as fuel for the fire. And Jesus says, if, if, how much are you not much more valuable than a flower? And yet look at how God clothes this flower. Will God not much more take care of you? And Jesus says, consider the birds. The birds take no thought for tomorrow. They work very, very hard, but they have no anxieties over the future. If God, if, if God cares about the birds, are you not much more valuable than they? Consider how valuable you are. That only when we come to know how, how valuable in God's sight are we, are we moved and motivated to live for Jesus. <laughs> the, the Matthew 6 says, is your, not, is your life not more important than food and clothing? Your life is a precious gift that God has given you. Do you ever stop to think, if you ever look at your family tree, how many people, you go back five or six or seven generations, how many different people had to come together, meet each other, have children together, and, and down through the generations to you? That you are one in a million that, that God had an intention for you to be alive, that God has bestowed you with this precious gift of life. Every one of us has a year when we were born. For me, it was 1973. And every one of us out there somewhere is a year when we will die. We have a life that is a precious gift, whether that life is six months, six years, 30 years, 90 or 105. It's a precious gift. And that dash, that gap between the year you were born and the year you die is a precious kind of gift that God calls us to use for his glory. It's a precious gift. I have two great grandfathers, and their names were Landis and Milton, and they both were born at the very turn of the century. And I always knew how old they were because they went with the year. In 1982, they were 82 years of age. And I think about this. If they, when, by the time they reached my age, age 47, that's how old I am now as of last week, they had experienced four incredible events. They had experienced the Spanish flu of 1918, where many, many people were killed. It must have been a terrifying time that we can now identify, perhaps, in ways we couldn't before. They experienced World War I in 1916, 17, 18, in that range there. They experienced the Great Depression in the 1930s, and then World War II in the late 30s and early 40s. All those four events by the time they were my age. All those events could have been seen as, as life-transforming, scary, frightening events. You know, in World War II, they didn't know how it was going to turn out. There were many people who wondered, would we someday be ruled by the Nazis? They didn't know how that would turn out. And yet, God knew all those things for people born in 1900. And God, God gave them the gift of life. With the full knowledge of all that would be ahead of them, God gave them the grace for those days. And God will give us the grace to live in what we're experiencing too. And one of the most important things we can do is to know how valuable we are in God's sight. Our family recently watched a movie called Castaways by starring Tom Hanks. Perhaps you've seen it. It's a good uh, quarantine kind of movie because here is, is Tom Hanks and his character is in a plane crash. And he, he, is he survives a plane crash and he's stranded on this island. And he is a very determined kind of person, and he, he is determined to survive. And it's a very differ, difficult way for him to survive on this island. And, and he's alone. He's isolated for four, five, six years. There he is on this island. And psychologically, it begins to really mess with his head to the point where he's mentally unstable enough that he has this volleyball that washes up on the beach that becomes a friend. He talks to this volleyball throughout the, the movie when he's really struggling with being isolated. But what really gets this character through this, uh, this time on this island, this, this six years where he's stranded alone, is this picture that he has with him of his fiance. And in the midst of all the difficulties, he is, to, he is tempted to give up. But he keeps looking at this picture of his fiance and remembering her love 
for him. And that is what gets him through. And eventually he gets off this island. And it was the, the knowing that somebody out there loved and cared for him gets him through. Now, as the story goes, this, uh, this fiance, she moved on and she married somebody else. So he, he lost her in many ways. But the point of the story is this, that the love of God, knowing you are loved by God, is what will get you through any kind of time. That's what sustains us. That's what gets us through, knowing we are loved. Human love will fail you. But the love of God, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Think about the disciple John. And John, it always makes me laugh just a bit. It always feels just a bit arrogant when John refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. I always feel like it would be a little bit funny to refer to myself as Tom, the, the person that Jesus loved. But, but God loves all of us. And I think what John had a really strong understanding of was just how much God loved him. He had a solid foundation in knowing he was loved by God. And many of the disciples died martyr deaths in various ways. And what John suffered and experienced was he was exiled to the island of Patmos. He had to be by himself on this island. And that would be extremely difficult for many people. Many people perhaps would rather die a martyr death than be exiled like John was. He was by himself. And the book of Revelation is the book that the Holy Spirit gave to the, the disciple John while he was on Patmos. And John says, I was in the Spirit of God on the Lord's Day. He was worshiping. He was in fellowship with the living God. In the midst of all the difficult things he maybe was experiencing and being alone, he was walking in fellowship with God in such a way that God was able to speak to him. And I can't help but wonder if it was this, this rock-solid identity that John had in knowing God loved him that enabled him to live such a fruitful kind of experience even while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. That's what God desires for each and every one of us. You are loved by God. And our obedience to God, our obedience to the teachings of Jesus does not come because we're super disciplined people or because we were raised well or anything like that. It comes from the power God gives us but becomes first and foremost knowing you are loved by God. That's what sustains us. Nothing can separate you and I from a love of God. You can name anything you want. And it's, it's beyond, beyond even our feelings. Our feelings cannot separate us from the love of God. May you be enriched and strengthened by that knowledge. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are loved. Receive this benediction. From Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May you overflow with the hope of God as a witness to the world around you. May you be blessed.